questions? Thank you. 
um, you know, he, I saw the photograph of the book, he like, press the ball. And, uh, so maybe we detracted, maybe we took three and a half years from his life and we gave it to a pizza. And so, it's not very much about. so that's one possibility. Okay, another idea. Yeah, I can't see that. Is that Rachel? Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe. Thank you for sitting in similar places. It helps me. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, something unobserved about you, not just your personality necessarily, maybe your physique, your body, your comportment, your attitude, all these things. So, and, and that might be what causes it. Now, what is an argument against that from the day to the day? So that's obviously the concern here. What kind of, how would this study potentially militate against that? There are three pieces of data on this graph. You were a scientist and you observed this data and you wanted to respond to Rachel. You can't, you can't do a perfect response to the concern she just articulated, but you can do it not a bad response. Yeah. What's your name? Ben. Ben. Yeah. So now these the letters are all very close and like they're still on the Yes. The winner one, exactly. So the argument would be the nominees probably also are just like the winners are instead of five that was selected. So maybe you know the nominees uh, are in fact not different than the actors. But if they, even if they were, if being nominated because you were a better actor, better personality, more physically fit, or whatever was different about you, that might explain why you might become a nominee. But the but the, the choice to be a, a winner might be something uh, different. Would be the argument. That's like moving you up a notch. And that's having a big effect. So that's in essence the argument that uh, that Riddlemeyer is uh, is trying to make actually uh, in this uh, in this study. And he had a very clever way of matching the the winners that he picked. And the, and the nominees, he picked other actors that were like in similar movies or the same movie and had similar traits. He tried to match as much as he could uh, for variables that might potentially capture some of the effects that were just discussed by Rachel. Um, now, here's a more recent, better conducted study that, uh, that it's not better, I mean, it just has more sort of mythological strength behind it that looked at Nobel laureates and nominees from 1900 to 1950. And so here the question is, does winning the Nobel Prize lengthen uh, your life? It gives you a million dollars, gives you the accolades, and uh, which is trivial, actually, in terms of the monetary. That's not what is so great about winning the Nobel Prize. Uh, so, um, and it looked at life expectancy at birth for 425 male physics and chemistry Nobel nominees. Um, and the nominees, and incidentally, you don't, they don't, you generally don't know if you've been nominated, and the records are sealed for 50 years. So by the time you could know, you were probably dead unless you were nominated in your 20s or 30s, and you lived to be in your 80s or 90s, then you can see what happened. You were nominated and didn't win a prize years and years ago. So the Nobel Committee released the records after about 50 years. People, you may have a hint that you've been nominated, or frankly told you you've been nominated. Often there's a lot of whispering that you have or haven't been nominated, but you can't actually be sure, and of course, only certain people uh, win. So the nominees uh, had a life expectancy of 75.8 years, and the winners, 77.2 about 1.4 years gained, or 26% reduction in hazard of death in the sort of kind of statistical model and the proportional hazard model. Um, so, so here's another different study, different population, similar impact, something about being revered by your peers, by others, and being placed at the top of the heap, here not financially or educationally, but here in terms of some other kind of status hierarchy, seems to have material benefits for your health. And so as in the case of SPOT, as in the case of socioeconomic status and health, and as we saw in a prior lecture, not only can there be two-way causation, so maybe it is that being the winner makes you healthier, not only could it be as someone who articulated being healthier makes you the winner, but it could be more complicated still, where in some prior or some third factor could be causing both outcomes, uh, and this is what these prior two observational studies tried to address using statistical methods and a kind of natural experiment. So here, what they're trying to do is say, okay, well, netting out or, or sort of accounting for the personality, appearance, or intelligence, or other traits of these uh, individuals, can we make a kind of claim that winning the award and being assigned quasi-randomly, quasi-experimentally a higher status is associated with health outcomes such as your uh, legitimate. And in fact, the question is, it might be great, or wouldn't it be great, if we could randomly assign people to different statuses and see how they respond uh, to stress. So raise your hands if you've heard about this, the famous Stanford prison experiment. So most of you have, so that must be a part of the curriculum here. So uh, it was a smaller group, I would um, ask one of you. 
do summer experiment that you're off of because it's a big group. Uh, this is a very famous experiment in which 24 student volunteers, they were Stanford students, very much like you, uh, in 1971, so 40 years ago now, who were screened for their physical and mental health, then were randomly assigned to either be prisoners or guards in a mock prison that was set up in the Stanford Psychology Department, which has led to all kinds of jokes since then. Stanford psychology in prison. But anyway, the, the investigator that did this was Phil Zimbardo. Um, and um, and uh, he actually, they actually went about um, 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 uh, trying to understand uh, how it might be that uh, otherwise identical individuals assigned to different status positions uh, might respond to this experiment. So uh, these kids, they were Stanford's kids, they agreed to. Uh, to, uh, to participate in the experiment. And once they agreed, then uh, unexpectedly things would happen. Uh, half of them that were randomly sent to be prisoners, uh, they were suddenly arrested publicly in front of their friends. Uh, they were put, I can't remember, in real handcuffs or fake handcuffs, but in any case, they were then taken to the psychology department, which had been fitted out to look like a jail. Offices had been turned into jail cells. There were guards in the corridors. These were other students that had been randomly assigned to uniforms and be guards. And, uh, and uh, they were stripped down, the students were stripped, uh, they were de -loused. they were subjected to all kinds of humiliating, bureaucratic standard uh, procedures, uh, and then they were put into their cells, and the guards who were given no training were told to guard the uh, prisoners uh, and keep uh, order. Uh, and um, and, um, uh, and in fact, uh, so they were then told that they had been uh, in fact arrested for armed uh, robbery or burglary, uh, they were um, they were warned of their rights, uh, and then they were handcuffed, in fact, and they were taken um, in front of everyone uh, to this prison. To this prison, they were um, in this uh, sort of fake uh, jail. They were uh, formally booked. They were again warned of their Miranda rights. They were fingerprinted, um, and then they were uh, uh, blindfolded and held in a holding cell to sort of ponder their impending fate. Uh, and each prisoner, uh, in addition to um, to uh, to uh, be treated in this sort of a humiliating way was that then not oriented to what was going to happen to them while they were in the, uh, in the, uh, in the jail. And then, and then the guards, and there were nine people that were randomly assigned to be guards, they worked three eight-hour shifts while three prisoners occupied each of the three barren cells uh, around the clock. Um, and the guards were given no specific training on how to be guards. Uh, instead, they were free within limits to do whatever they thought was necessary to maintain law and order in the prison and to command the respect uh, in fact, the guards made up their own set of rules, which they carried out under the effect, under the supervision of, uh, of war, Warden David Jaffe, who was an undergraduate at Stanford. They were warned, however, of the potential seriousness of their mission and the possible dangers of the situation they were about to enter, enter and, as, and of course, as, as real guards um, uh, are, are warned that there's a potentially dangerous position and that this is a rough crowd uh, that, they, that they have to um, and in fact, the first day passed without incident, um, and the investigators were totally unprepared for what happened next, because on the second day, there was a rebellion among the prisoners. The prisoners removed their stockings, uh, stocking caps, ripped off their numbers, and barricaded themselves inside the cells by putting their beds up against the door. And now the problem was, what were the guards going to do about the rebellion? And the guards were really very angered and frustrated because the prisoners also began to taunt and curse them to deliberately provoke them, even though none of this had been suggested or guided. Uh, and when the morning shift guards came on, this was overnight, uh, they became very upset at the night shift of guards because they felt those night shifts had been too lenient. And the guards had to handle the rebellion themselves, and they decided what to do with it. They broke into each cell, they stripped the prisoners naked, these were students, your, your age. Um, took the beds out, and forced the ringleaders of the prisoner rebellion into solitary confinement. They made up the idea of solitary confinement, and generally began to harass and intimidate the prisoners. And less than 36 hours into the experiment, a particular prisoner, number 8612, um, began suffering from acute emotional disturbance, disorganized thinking, and uncontrolled crime and rage. But in spite of all this, um, the, uh, uh, the prisoners, the guards, had thought that the, uh, the guards, rather, had thought that the prisoners were making it up and just trying uh, to con them, uh, in, in, to fool them into releasing this particular uh, uh, prisoner. So, um, so what happened? So the, the scientists conducting this experiment are observing this situation. 
situation in which they've experimentally manipulated and causes a horrible situation in which otherwise identical people are half are treated as are given the task of guards, and the other half are given the task of prisoners. There's a rebellion, it's put down in a kind of violent and certainly obnoxious way. Um, and um, and uh, and then later on, Zimbardo, when he was asked about this, uh, talked about how they decided to um, end, um, end the experiment. And here's what he said. I ended the study prematurely for two reasons. Oh, incidentally, these are a reunion. So this is the uh, this is the, the Stanford Psychology Department. Here are the prisoners, you know, being stripped and uh, and you know spread eagle and then being stripped and then put into their cells and put into these sort of humiliating little johnnies. They're given humiliating tasks like cleaning the toilets uh, in the in the, in the prison. Uh, and this is years later. Uh, this is a former prisoner and this is a former guard uh, who randomly assigned these tasks. Still not at peace with each other, like talking about uh, their experience. And all of this stuff is available in the case of prison X So so here's what Zimbardo said many years later. I ended the study prematurely for two reasons. First, we had learned through videotapes that the guards were escalating their abuse of prisoners in the middle of the night when they thought no researchers were watching and the experiment was pulled off. Their boredom had driven them to even ever more pornographic and degrading abuse of the prisoners. That's the first reason. Here's the second reason. Second, Christina Maslach, and I do not think it's a coincidence incidentally that she was a woman, a recent Stanford PhD brought in to conduct interviews with the guards and the prisoners, strongly objected when she saw the prisoners being marched on a toilet run, bags over their heads, legs chained together, hands on each other's shoulders. Filled with outrage, she said, it's terrible what you are doing to these boys. Out of 50 or more outsiders who had seen our prison, she was the only one who ever questioned its morality. Once she encountered the power of the situation, however, it became clear suddenly to all involved that the study should be ended. And so, after only six days, their planned two-week prison simulation was pulled off. So, in the 60s and 70s, there was a spate of experiments like this which you couldn't, couldn't do anymore for various ethical reasons. Uh, I couldn't do that experiment at Yale today. Um, but um, for, for the obvious reasons. But this is some data that we have for, uh, from the, the tiny experiment, the very uh, 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 extreme experiment you might imagine doing uh, to test the role of hierarchy in these types of situations. <coughs> so to summarize where we are now, uh, low socioeconomic status or low income can be linked to poor individual and population health in several ways. Those in the lowest group may have worse health because they lack the resources to acquire health, poor nutrition, housing, and so forth, and this definitely happens. But as we have seen, this cannot explain the gradient in health seen even at upper ranks. Moreover, those in the lowest group may have adequate resources in an absolute sense, but they may still suffer because of their relative position. Being at the bottom is bad regardless of your absolute circumstances. So being assigned the role of a prisoner in an experiment, even if you're a white Stanford undergraduate, still is bad. This is one of the ways that income inequality might be harmful. Perceptions of being relatively deprived are stressful, and it is these psychosocial factors, more than material factors, that play a role in the health. Moreover, being at the bottom can interfere with your capabilities, can interfere with your ability to translate what you have into what you want. And finally, it is possible that it's not just those at the bottom, but that everyone might suffer from income inequality, for example, because of underinvestment in public goods, such as pollution prevention or public education. So you can link population socioeconomic status to individual and population health, both by looking at actual deprivation and by looking at people's relative deprivation. So now the question becomes, well, what do we do about that? What does our species, what do we do? Kind of social institutions have been developed, what kind of biological uh, strategies have been being equipped with in order to cope with the stress of relative deprivation and the unavoidable presence of hierarchy in social systems. Whether this hierarchy or the stress originates from physical or social circumstances. And coping strategies, beyond your intrinsic biological ones, like we are equipped, our bodies are equipped with mechanisms to deal with and cope with stress consists of behavioral or cognitive attempts to manage specific stressful situational demands. And one can draw on personal resources of various kinds to do this. So how do you cope with stress? 
all of us are equipped biologically with certain techniques to cope with stressful experiences, whether physical or mental. But in addition, we can deploy other sorts of strategies. We can deploy cognitive strategies for thinking about your experience, behavioral strategies, changing what you do, or social strategies, depending on others, for help uh, around us. Simple-mindedly, if you can do something about the problem, you draw on behavioral resources, you change your actions and you fix the problem. And if not, you can't actually think about the problem. You attempt to develop a sense of personal mastery, cognitively or psychologically. You say, well, I can't actually fix this annoying roommate of mine. So I can't, you know, I talk to the dean, I can't get rid of them, I can't get out of the roommate situation. It's really stressful for me, but all the various reasons roommates can sometimes be stressful. Uh, so instead, I'm going to change my mind about the situation and think, actually, this is terrific. No, and to sort of totally change your perspective on the circumstances. Or, if you can't change cognitively uh, or, uh, you know, what the circumstances are, you might adopt other strategies, which is going to your friends and asking for support and help in, in confronting or facing and understanding or um, accepting uh, this type of a stressful situation. So you might draw on social support to buffer the impact of the stress. Now, interestingly, Evidence suggests that perceived support is often as important as real support. And this is actually one of the more depressing findings in the literature as far as I'm concerned. It seems to matter, it seems not to matter whether you're actually being helped by your friends. It, it, what seems to matter is whether you think you're being helped by your friends. And that's enough. Like most of the variation can be explained just by looking at how you feel about what kind of connections you have, what kind of support you're getting. Not, not so much by the actual support that you're getting. And in fact, having a significant other is a key measure of social support. Uh, we'll be turning uh, next to a very considerable importance of social support and social networks in one's health. So now we're going to be trying to understand how it is that uh, social connections of different kinds are salubrious and in part how they work by buffering the stress imposed not only by relative deprivation, but more general. Is there any questions so far? Okay, so here's a classic study on uh, this regard. Uh, this isn't it, but we introduced the course of a classic study by Neil Durkheim who looked at suicide over 100 years ago, and he suggested that people living in more socially isolated circumstances, less integrated ones, were more likely to take their own lives. And you may remember that we began the course of this example. And in fact, there's been a long history of work looking at the risk of suicide and how that relates to the extent of one's social connections. Here results from another much more recent study looking at both suicide and traumatic death. So in young people especially, um, reckless behavior is sometimes very hard to distinguish from suicide. So if someone is driving a car very fast at night and crashes into a tree, if they have a death wish because they kill themselves, or were they merely being reckless, it's hard to tell. But in any case, they end their lives. So sometimes those categories are, are lumped together. Um, and so here's some evidence of social connections and relative risk of traumatic death and suicide among men. On the y-axis is the relative risk. Here is unmarried men, uh, their risk. Here is unmarried men who also have no close relatives, a higher risk. Uh, and here is compared to married uh, uh, men or people with a, uh, a partner uh, with no excess risk. And here is uh, the risk of not belonging to the church. So not being married uh, compared to being married uh, increases your relative risk of this type of uh, traumatic or suicidal death by a factor of three. Lacking close relatives by a factor of four not belonging to a church, again, developing the theme about the benefits of religion that we discussed with the lectures ago, also uh, can be harmful, increasing the risk of suicide in this observational study. Yeah, what was your name? Haley. Haley. In that study, was the baseline I don't know whether they controlled for the other things in this particular study. I suspect it was an independent effect of each of these. And of course, if you did all three of them, it wouldn't be multiplicative because they're not independent. So probably if you were married, had relatives, and belonged to a church, it wouldn't you know, go three plus four plus two, whatever that would be, so nine times uh, lower risk. It would be you know, maybe six or something. You see what I mean? So there's so zero is Zero is no excess risk in each category. So in each of these, it's like, what is the excess risk of not being married compared to being married? So if it was zero, it would mean there was no difference between the groups. This says there's four times relative risk of having this type of death from not being married compared to being married, et cetera. But what your question was, was 
But what if you have all of these three things? Is it really, really bad? And it definitely is worse, but it's not cumulatively bad. Well, I think in this, I think in this, there, there are ways in which, and I, I talked about this a little bit at the beginning. There are ways 
many societies to civilize its men. Uh, and there are all kinds of ways that social integration results in better behavior in men. Uh, and uh, I think we'll be talking about that in just a minute, actually. So I'll come, I'll come back to that. Yeah. It's possible, but the thing is, what I don't remember is, I don't think that this is just trading quantity for quality, because the different studies measure it in different ways. So I, you're right in what you're saying. So, although this is also complicated. I mean, it's very easy to make kind of sexist generalizations about these things. Uh, but I mean, said that I make one. Uh, it's, uh, men tend to do things with their friends, and women tend to talk about things with their friends. And uh, there's something about that talking that is extremely helpful, actually. So, you know. Um, so in fact, the single most important source of social support in the lives of adults is whether they have an intimate partner, typically a spouse. So this is uh, this shows the health benefits of marriage. On the y-axis is the proportion surviving, and here is the age of years. And here's the risk, here's the mortality curve for the married. So you know, if you're married uh, at 48, your chance to, you know, you're maybe, I don't know, whatever that is, a 10% chance, or no, not even a 10, but like, this is 0.8, so you've got like a, like a 4% chance of dying by the time you're 65. Here's a curve for widow, here's a curve for divorce, and here's a curve for uh, never married. So the unmarried state is bad for your health uh, in this situation. And our best estimates, using observational studies, are that if we could do a huge experiment, take 10,000 men, and we randomly assign the men, half the men, to be married, to randomly chosen women, we don't let them pick their wife, we randomly assign them. So it's two-stage randomization, that this would add seven years to a man's life. So random, so we do an experiment where we can take these guys and randomly assign you a random woman that you would gain seven years of life. And our best estimate is that if we could take 10,000 women and randomly assign women to be married to a randomly chosen man, it would take away seven years of life. Uh, no, it would uh, that it adds two years to their lives. So women benefit less from entering into marriage than men benefit, which is one of the questions that was just asked. Now part of that may be that women just have less upside in general, because they live longer than men, so they have less potential upside. But part of it may also be to how it is that marriage actually uh, is working. It's, there's been some hints in the literature, and I wish we could do this study better, but it's very difficult for various reasons. If we could, if we could randomly assign um, uh, men to be randomly married to other men. So we can randomly assign you to be married, but we're not going to assign you to a woman, we're going to assign you to a man as your partner. You would each gain about two years to your lives. And if we could randomly assign women to be married to other women, they would each gain about seven years to their lives. So it's not marriage that's salubrious, it's marriage to a woman that's salubrious. <laughs> now these are very difficult studies to do observationally, and of course empirically it would be almost impossible to do a study like that. Uh, but, um, and this has led some people, myself included, to, to ask, what about polygamy? Like, if you could assign me two wives, which my wife Erica doesn't like this experiment, <laughs> if you do two wives, you would add even more. And there are all kinds of reasons it's hard to, that, that polygamous uh, uh, circumstances are making it difficult to, uh, to, uh, to assess that, because there's so much else that's different about polygamy than, uh, than in that circumstance. And in fact, entry into marriage is helpful. And exit for marriage is harmful when it comes to your health. Now, the widower, the widower effect, or the increased probability of the recently relieved to die, is an incredibly well-known uh, phenomenon. So for over 150 years, social scientists have been studying the widowhood effect. That when I die, my wife's risk of death goes up, and when she dies, my risk of death goes up. It's been seen in multiple studies. It's more pronounced than men and women. So men suffer more from the loss of a wife than women suffer from the loss of a husband. Their health status. The relative risk of death in men when they lose their wife, when their wife dies, is between 1.3 and 2. So my risk of death goes up between 30% and 100% after my wife dies. And the mechanism of this effect is, uh, is multifaceted. There are many ways in which this effect might work. And in fact, this is a canonical finding in the social sciences dating back to 1858 when it was first described by William Farr. And this is discussed and connected with you meet uh, next week. In fact, like Durkheim and suicide, like the incest taboo, like the law of supply and demand, this is a, one of the most sort of well-studied, well-accepted 
sort of canonical findings in the social sciences. And in fact, it's a basic fact of our existence. It's pretty much seen everywhere and at all times by and large. And it's supported by countless observational studies. So the way it seems to work is as follows. So here you have the risk of death. And here is a, so here is a, uh, here is a man. Uh, here are the men in the solid line. So here are the guys. They're cruising along, and then they get married. And then the risk of death plummets upon entry into marriage. And this has been called uh, by demographers the get rid of the motorcycle in the garage line. So upon entry into marriage, men assume adult roles. They stop smoking, they quit using drugs, they get rid of the motorcycle, uh, they get a job, and they, uh, they grow up. Okay? And all of that uh, uh, improves their health. And this stays, their risk of death stays at this level. But then if your wife dies, the risk of death skyrockets after the death, exceeds what the risk of death is before entry into marriage or during marriage, not surprisingly. Remember, we, we saw how the, uh, how the widow uh, had a uh, higher, uh, well, in this case, a lower risk of death than never married. Um, and, uh, and then after the wife dies, they gradually decline again. So it's not as bad after a year or two after you've been a uh, widow, but your risk of death here during widowhood is still higher than these other states. Now, for women, the health benefits of marriage take longer to arrive. So women do the end are smaller, so the, the dip down, the dip from here to here is not as big as the dip from there to there. Uh, and, they, and the curve here is more gradual than it is over there. But there are, they are different. So women do benefit. Uh, the health does benefit from injury into marriage. And they also suffer when their husbands die. But the, 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 the worsening is not as acute and it's not as large. So this is what happens to women as shown uh, in this curve. Yeah, for all. Pension, 
all of that stuff, don't go away with me, guys. You see, he's already retired in his 70s. It's not his earnings at that point. So his death doesn't deprive her of the thing that he was giving to her that was reducing her mortality. This is a gross caricature of, of an enormous literature, but that's basically the story. So there are different mechanisms by which a couple helps each other to improve their survival, it includes social connection, it includes economic outcomes, it includes behavioral changes, these vary their gender, how these things work, and, um, and, uh, and therefore they can see the signature of this by the time stamp of the decline, the, how quickly mortality improves. And that's also incidentally why it takes uh, uh, both these time stamps vary, this gradual uh, improvement here and the abrupt improvement in the gradual improvement there the abrupt improvement there. Did I kind of give an adequate summary of that question? What was your name again? Just uh, Yeah, so remarriage is helpful, and the loss of the second wife is, is, uh, is, 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 uh, is equally harmful. We did, I think, uh, in collaboration with the former graduate student of mine, we did the only study that I know of where we looked at, um, at, the, at the death of your current wife versus the death of your ex-wife. We found that the death of your current wife harms you, but the death of your ex-wife has no effect. So, uh, so um, and there's a technical reason we did that. If you're interested, if you look up Elbert and your stock, you'll find uh, but I had something else I wanted to say about uh, about this when you said uh, there was a question about the, the re-entry to marriage. Um, oh, now one of the things that may be happening in our society is these effects may be different in more egalitarian societies or in societies where women have the same earning power as men. So let's say you uh, change society as it is changing now, so women have the same income opportunities as men do. But if in fact economic advancement was the principal mechanism by which entry to marriage was improving women's uh, uh, health in the past, you would see a different pattern, right? You would see not as much of an improvement in women, because when a, a woman who, can, who doesn't need a man for money um, gets married, and if that's the way, in fact, marriage was previously helping women, you wouldn't see as much of this decline. And conversely, when a man dies, you wouldn't see as much harm in women. And there is some hint in the literature that this is, in fact, the case. So if you go to more egalitarian societies like Sweden, you see the pattern is not quite the way I've summary I've given you. And it remains to be seen in your generation whether the pattern is the same, okay? But the general story, even though the details are different, the general story is the one I'm telling you. That entry into marriage is good for both sexes, and the mechanism probably differs between the sexes, yeah. So what about children? How, how does that affect that? We have very little data on this. Either how the death of a child affects the risk of in a parent, it does. There's a famous paper in the Journal of Medicine from years ago. And conversely, how the death of a parent in an adult child affects the risk of death of a, of a child. There are effects there, but we have nowhere near as much information. So yes, these interpersonal effects occur. Yeah? Not sure related to marriage, but I'm wondering, given the fact that like, you view women as a more socially oppressed group, wouldn't it make more sense that women's um, mortality rate could be higher? Or is it well, that's the thing that's so ironic. It's like, like I, I, uh, I don't know how much more oppressed women are. I mean, I guess, in general, and there are all kinds of ways that there's still sexism in our society. But in one very important way, they are not oppressed. You guys live longer than we do. I mean, it's, it's great to do. You're, you're going to live four times. Is that biological? Yes, I'm sure that's biological. Yeah. So women live longer than men by a lot, um, and they attack everywhere. I mean, they're very. The societies where that doesn't happen are really misogynistic societies. Um, so there are one or two countries on the planet where mortality between men and women, uh, first of all, lots of sides of the scheme of infanticide, that takes an enormous hit in force on women's survival. But even controlling for, let's say, survival at age one, there are a couple of societies on the planet, I think Afghanistan is one of them, where, um, where there's no difference in, in longevity between women and men. When you find that, you know it's a devastating environment to be in. So, um, uh, but yeah, other questions?
years to get colon cancer. So you, you would ideally expect to see the mortality signature in the surviving spouse to be, uh, to be elevated in things like suicide, traumatic death, strokes, heart attacks, things like that. Uh, and, or things related to not taking the medication. So you know, men that stop taking their medication when their wife dies, then you know, they spike it. Very interesting topic. In fact, this is how I got into this. Uh, when I, um, in fact, it's a nice segue to how just to tell you about how I got into social networks. So when I, uh, I told you before that you know when I was a boy, my mother was very sick and she died when I was 25, and um, I, I became very interested in end of life care. We talked in the end of life care segment about that, and um, uh, at some point, as I was caring for people who were seriously ill, I became very interested in how their illness was affecting others, and I will talk to you about that. Uh, and I, and I. And I had been sort of studying how to improve end of life care in our society for a long, long time. And my wife one day came to me and she said, you know, you were getting depressed from studying death and destruction all the time. In fact, I spent 10 years studying like how to make terminal care better in our country, just banging my head against the wall. And, um, and Erica said, you know, why, why don't you study something else? And I said, like what? And she said, like babies, you know, study the birds, you know, just like this. And, uh, and so in fact, um, in fact, there's a kind of witty uh, way that the, 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 the Brits call uh, sort of uh, vital statistics um, departments that record, keep records of vital statistics, you know, the birth and death and marriage and so forth. They call it hatch, match, and dispatch. And, uh, and so I had been studying dispatch, and Erica proposed that I study hatch. So I just put the difference and decided to study match. And so I began to study the widowhood effect, which is some of the earlier papers I just alluded to. And that then led me to study social networks in a way I'll tell you uh, about after the break. And that was the last thing to see. Okay, other questions? Yeah, I can't see who that is. Taylor. Yeah. Taylor. Yeah. 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 yeah, cool. You said that if a woman marries a woman, they're actually, their life is made increases more than if they marry a man, right? Yes. So we that, think it's not it's very tenuous, yeah. Okay, but uh, yeah, so basically that would imply that the woman would Be a different mechanism. Yeah, they improve behavioral kind of thing. Oh, yeah. It, but it's, it's something about, we don't know exactly what it is. In fact, men who have more daughters live longer than men who have more sons. Uh, basically, being near women is good for you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I mean, that's just, you know, again, it's hard to talk about things like very sex, but I mean, if you look at the literature, it's pretty clear, you know. Uh, so, um, in all kinds of ways, actually. So, I mean, there are other issues with being in, in all women uh, groups, uh, which I don't into, but um, uh, you know, which can not be so pleasant, but but uh, but in terms of hell, it's pretty good, actually. Yeah.
say that's the world that we live in. And now I go out into a group of people, and I see you guys, your spouse died, and your risk of death went up, up afterwards. What might actually be happening in that case is the death of your spouse might be a marker for the unobserved unhealthiness of you. You see, your spouse's death isn't causing your death. Your spouse's death just sends a, is a signal that you weren't healthy in the beginning, to begin with. So homogamy. So causation, or the first one, is the tendency of the married to get healthy. Homogamy, or the second one, is the tendency of the healthy to get married. Or there could be a third explanation, or confounding. So there could be something else that's making you both more likely to get married and more likely to get healthy, as we discussed uh, before. So, um, and in fact, when discussing social support, it's important to attend to several aspects. Okay, so that, that's that. Now, so we've already begun to, through the course of the questions to think about what are some of the mechanisms by which this might work? Well, how, how is it that it's working? And there are a number of ways that connection to another person might, uh, might uh, be relevant and things that they might do for you. So if you're trying to quantify the nature of the support that you're getting, picking up on what we were discussing earlier, there are a few things you might be interested in. You might be interested in the extent of support, how much support you have. You might be interested in the content of the support. What is this person actually doing for you? Like, what is your friend actually doing for you when you complain about your movement? Uh, it could be a question of reciprocity. I say that you are my friend, you might or might not reciprocate the friendship. And I give you things, you might or might not reciprocate those things. So the extent to which we exchange support might be important. And there's the issue I already alluded to of the difference between perceived and real support. Whether you perceive the relationship as being a supportive or whether in fact it is real. So you can ask questions like how many ties do people have? Are they intimate, long-standing, or mutual ties? How interconnected are people? What's being exchanged by people? How diverse are the ties? You have many different kinds of ties and so forth. And one of the important things Excuse me, one of the important things to realize about what we're talking about today is that social support is not the same thing as a social network. It's like a little bit like the difference between income inequality, which is an intrinsically group property, and income, which is an individual uh, property. So social support is something that applies to you. I can quantify your social support, how much you're giving or how much you're receiving. A network, and it's, it's what's known in the, in the literature as an egocentric reduction. I reduce something about your environment down to you, and I say, this is how much support you have. That's completely different than a social network study, which actually maps the complex interactions around you, looks at the whole graph in ways that we will discuss in just a bit. And also notice that social relationships can be burdensome or even harmful. For example, as we saw earlier with the smoking, you can be harmed because your, your partner is smoking and you're inhaling secondhand smoke. Or intimate partner violence would be another example. Or expectations that you might be helpful, burdens of expectations that the people you're connected to uh, impose on you. And the mechanism of this effect and the pathways of the effect are, in fact, very complicated. For example, social isolation is associated with the onset of illness, such as cardiovascular disease. So here's one study that looked at social support and cardiovascular disease incidents in men. Here's the adjusted relative risk of cardiovascular disease. Here's the level of social connectedness. Fully integrated individuals, they have no excess risk, they're set to one in this metric, and socially isolated individuals have almost two times the risk of fully integrated ones of having cardiovascular disease to begin with, onset of disease. And in fact, social isolation is also associated with the outcome of cardiovascular disease after its incidence. So this shows the mortality after myocardial infarction, that's a heart attack, depending on a number of sources of emotional support. So here we're looking at different groups, for example, let's look at women. So among women who have no social support, this is their mortality, uh, the fraction that die after heart attack. So 50, what is it, 40% of the women who have no social support might die after heart attack, compared to 30% of those that have at least one source of social support, and 20, uh, whatever that is, 20% of those that have two or more. So in women, how, uh, whether you die or not, after you have a heart attack depends on how much social support similar pattern in men, this effect of social support is present in both the old and the young, but it would appear to be greater in the old, you see there's a steeper uh, movement here than here. 
said he had individuals and the respondents were asked, can you count on anyone to provide you with emotional support, meaning talking over problems or helping you make a difficult decision? And this study avoids confounding illness and support by measuring the support well before the illness. So if I go out and I look at people who are ill and I say they have no friends, well, which came first? Did they have no friends and that's why they fell ill? Or after they got ill, will all their friends avoid them? In this study, how many sources of emotional support people had were measured years before the heart attack came on. Then they waited for the heart attack and then they saw how likely were you to die after the heart attack depending on how many friends you had at some kind of a prior uh, period. And in fact, the multivariate modeling adjusting for numerous demographic and clinical attributes, having no emotional support was associated with a substantially higher risk of death, almost tripling the risk of death. And here's some results looking at whether the diversity of, uh, of someone's, uh, uh, someone's uh, uh, a person's social support is beneficial. Uh, and these results come from a clever experiment in which people were actually affirmatively exposed to infections uh, and assess the relationship between social network diversity and whether an exposure to a virus can make you sick. So what they did in this study is, is they took people and they measured how, uh, how many different kinds of friends they had. Then they brought them into the laboratory and they deliberately infected them by dripping a virus into their nose. And then they counted whether or not they got an infection by a number of ways, by having them report their symptoms, and they also collected and weighed all of their hankies for snot. So they measured all the snot production uh, in this uh, uh, group. And they found that uh, if you had high network diversity, you were less likely to get a cold and you produced less snot. I'm not showing you the snot production slide. Uh, I should have a picture of snot here, actually, in the future. Uh, so, uh, so this, you know, this is another way that your network diversity, now your network, you're measured in terms of your diversity of the network might, uh, might affect you. And the argument that social network diversity, as well as other attributes of networks, like their size or connectivity, is salubrious, rests in part on this kind of causal chain, which people are trying to tease out. So for example, here we imagine that you have a diverse sort of network with many different kinds of friends. I don't mean racial diversity, I mean just the different kinds of help and support you can get. Uh, this might lead to improved feelings of self-worth, which might lead to hormonal changes or better behaviors, or this diversity could lead to decreased stress, which also leads to hormonal changes, and those hormonal changes could lead to an improved immune system, or the better, and which could then lead to improved host resistance, and these better behaviors could also lead to improved host resistance, and this could lead to better health. So people are trying to tease out this kind of causal uh, chain uh, in this uh, type of situation. And this set of causal pathways also highlights how social factors, in fact, can affect our biology either by directly causing biological changes, for example, the hormonal changes or immune changes shown above, or by influencing behaviors that then indirectly have such effects. And this study that I just showed you of the COVID study of the virus, the virus in the nose is especially valuable because it's clear that there can be no reverse causation here. They're experimentally infected with the, the, the pathogen. It cannot be the case that having a cold in response to having a virus drift into your nose cause the network diversity that the subjects have. Indeed, there are many mechanisms by which social support might in fact be salubrious. So to summarize the kinds of effects that have been found and that we've, some of which we've been discussing, social support can buffer with stress and that might improve your health. It can have positive neuroendocrine effects. It can have positive cardiovascular effects. It can lead to better sleep and physiological repair. It can encourage you to have good behaviors. It can provide emotional support, it can provide practical support, it can involve informational support, your friends tell you things that are useful, and it can promote a kind of sense of meaning and uh, coherence. Now, indeed, it may turn out that any kind of connection uh, might be helpful. In fact, connection to kitten, kittens uh, might be helpful. It turns out that it's not just connection to other people that's beneficial, connection to pets can be beneficial. And this very handsome, very happy young man is, uh, is Sam Southgate's uh, nephew. Uh, oh. <laughs> and he's holding his cat. So you take this unhappy kid, you give him a cat, and all of a sudden, he's a very happy uh, little boy. And here's a study, um, 
Here's a study comparing spouses to friends and to pets. So they took 240 married couples, and half of these married couples had a pet, and half of them did not. And the pet owners are shown in the clear bars, and the non-pet owners are shown in the black bars. And then, while they were in their own homes, the various cardiovascular parameters were measured in the respondents while the subjects were being stressed. And the stress that they were given, I love this, this is what scientists do when they want to be stressing people. Either they have you put your hand in a bucket of ice water and hold it there, which is stressful, or they give you complicated math problems. <laughs> so they give you a math test, and they're either going to put your hand in ice water or they're going to give you a math test. And now we're going to check how do you respond to the stress depending on whether your spouse is present, your friend is present, or a pet is present. So uh, on the left it shows uh, heart rate, and on the left it, so it shows um, systolic blood pressure, and it shows the changes in these parameters under experimental conditions of having your hand in ice water. So, um, so here we look at this, so this is cardiovascular, cardiovascular reactivity during the cold presser task by pet ownership and presence of pets or others. So here is how your blood pressure goes up if you're not a pet owner uh, and you're alone, or you're a non-pet owner, so it goes up if you're alone, uh, by about 15 millimeters of mercury in either case. If you're, a pet, if you're a pet owner and your pet is present and you put your hand in a bucket of ice water, your blood pressure goes down. But if you're not a pet owner uh, and you have a friend present, instead of a pet, your blood pressure goes up a little bit. So in fact, in this particular case, it's better to have a pet than a friend. So what happens, here's what happens when you have a spouse. Uh, if you have a spouse present, if you're, if, you're uh, if you're a pet owner and your spouse is present, you benefit this much. If you're a non-pet owner and your spouse is present, you benefit this much. So it's good to have your spouse, but it's especially good to have a spouse and a pet. And here's what happens when you have a pet or a friend and your spouse present, the benefits that accrue in that circumstance. And in fact, if you look over here now, and it's, I'm sorry, this is beats per minute, not millimeters of mercury. If you look now at your actual systolic blood pressure, you look at millimeters of mercury difference, you can now do a number of comparisons. You can compare the difference of this uh, group of people to this group of people, it's good to have a pet or a friend present. So people who are facing the cold pressure task in the alone have a higher rate, rate, higher increase in their blood pressure than people doing the cold pressure task in the presence of a pet or a friend. So having a pet or a friend is good, but it, in fact, there's no difference between having a pet or a friend, or if anything, it's even better to have a pet. Uh, if you're a pet owner, it's better to have your pet present than if you're a non-pet owner to have a friend present. So these two, these two lines are different from each other, and these set of two is different than this uh, set of two uh, lines. So, um, so it might, so in fact, it might not be connection to people that is important, but rather connection itself that's important. And it might not even be whether the connection actually exists that's important. It might be whether you think it exists that's really important. Your sense of connection, it's almost religious actually, your sense of connection to others, uh, whether real or not, and whether they are real people or not, uh, may be the most important thing. And this is a topic that we're going to be spending a lot of time on uh, next time. Are there any questions? Yeah, we have a blue hat. I don't know your name, but Victoria. Victoria. Um, yeah, when you just said that last point, it, it brought to my mind uh, the movie A Beautiful Mind. And so I wonder if it's about people who imagine. No, I, I mean, schizophrenia is such an unusual, almost certainly purely biological condition that the, the existence of imaginary beings in schizophrenia is probably a little bit. Uh, but you can, uh, you can imagine, I, I, I'm sure such an experiment has been done. I, 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 I mean, it's so obvious to me, but I, I uh, well, maybe it hasn't been done, I don't know. You could imagine uh, doing experiments in psychology, psychology labs where you cultivated people's sense that they have a friend. Ran into a sign of a teddy bear or something when they came in to do an experiment. Uh, or the difference between having a teddy bear with a face and one without a face, or a block versus a teddy bear, or a photograph of a person versus a photograph of a friend. I mean, there are all kinds of experiments and manipulations that you can imagine that would cultivate a the sense of social connection, and then so you can see how people respond or not. But the, the line on the, uh, and if you did an observational study, and I asked you guys, some of you, Study of whether that is associated with longevity, 
maybe the ability to cult cultivate an image of an imaginary friend is salubrious. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I would suspect so.
and says, you know, bring us delicious food. And Copperfield does. And these waiters walk in, you know, like with big plates of food in this hotel. They come to the bedside and deliver the food. And then the, then the wife's turn. She goes, you know, we like terrific music. And Copperfield goes, Pff. And this mariachi band appears out of nowhere and starts, like, serenading them. And then the husband goes, make me irresistible. And Copperfield lifts the sheet up in front of the couple and drops it. And the man has been turned into a dog. And on, on cue, the wife goes, oh, speedy! And he leads over to the dog. So I saw this ad and I suddenly realized that my experience, which I thought was so distinctive, actually is a meme. Like, everyone in this society knows this experience, and I was not the first person to have it. Have a good brain. <laughs>